Hello, everyone. Welcome again to another Vita Learning Webinar. Uh, today we're going to have uh, Dr. Julian Canejo. Hi, Julian. How are you doing? Hello, Jim. I'm doing great. Thank you. All right. Excellent. So, welcome. Sorry to hear about your um, your in-law pass of their passing. I um, thank you so much, that. Jim. Uh, not to share too much to the audience, but uh, Julian's been out of the country for a few weeks. Uh, so we're glad to have uh, Dr. Caneo work with us again today on this webinar. Uh, it's going to be very exciting today. We're going to talk about uh, uh, clinical and laboratory, you know, the workflow, that the processing to ensure the success success for laminate veneers, uh, which is kind of a lost art, don't you think, Dr. Caneo? That you know. Uh, fewer and fewer GPs are doing cutting for veneers, micro uh, veneers, uh, no prep veneers and things like that. So uh, information like this that you're going to provide us is good for uh, for all of us to uh, enjoy. So before we forward. get going, yeah, so before we get going, uh, I am going to uh, do a little housekeeping items. Uh, everyone that is participating that's online, you are on mute, so you won't be able to holler out any questions. So on the panel, on the right-hand side of your screen, you should find a panel, a GoToWebinar panel, and there is a question box. So just open that up and type in your question. And then if it's um, an important, urgent uh, question, we'll, we'll tackle it during the presentation. But if not, we have the last uh, part of this webinar, we'll spend some time with the Q&A with uh, Dr. Conejo. Uh, so please make sure that you uh, go ahead and uh, send that question in. Now, we are going to record this so you can visit it later. It's going to be on our uh, VITA YouTube channel and the VITA uh, North America uh, channel, learning websites and so forth. So those will be posted. Uh, just give us a couple of days. And right now, we're going to, I'm going to introduce um, Dr. Caneo. Um, Dr. Caneo obtained his um, degree from the University of Latina, Costa Rica in 2005, and then completed training as a prosthodontist at the uh, Universidad Intercontinental Mexico in 2008. Uh, he's a visiting scholar at the Department of Pre Preventive and Restorative Sciences, the University of Pennsylvania, uh, UPenn. Uh, he does practice clinical dentistry and does uh, extensive research for UPenn and is currently the uh, clinical CAD CAM director. You guys have uh, made some great strides at the University of UPenn to bring in some uh, CAD CAM equipment. Uh, is that right, Dr. Caneo? Yeah, that's correct. And uh, I prepared some slides to show everyone uh, exactly how we work uh, from both the chair side and, and the lab side, as, as we commented before. Uh, getting this uh, webinar ready. All right. And then, uh, of course, from your research experience, uh, you've written several reviewed, uh, peer-reviewed articles and studies. And so I would like to introduce now uh, Dr. Julian Caneo on the clinical success for laboratory and chair-side laminate veneers, a minimalist workflow. Welcome and thank you. And I will turn this over to you, Dr. Caneo. Thank you so much, Jim, for your kind uh, introduction. And I want to welcome everyone. Thanks for spending the time with us. Um, show my screen. Yeah, Jim, can you confirm that everything is yeah. okay with my screen? Perfect. Yeah, so I want to thank Vita North America for, for the uh, invitation and the effort for providing uh, uh, continuous education for uh, both uh, clinicians and laboratory technicians. My name is Julian Conejo, and now I'm the uh, clinical CAD CAM director at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, I'm a prosthodontist, and I've been involved with the lab uh, since um, I finished my uh, pros residency. And, and I really see both sides of, of the equation and, and the challenges that we have both in the clinic, but also on the lab. And today, I want to focus only on laminate veneers. I want to focus on, on key aspects that I think could be helpful for you, both from the clinician perspective and from the uh, laboratory perspective. So um, for the past six years, I, I, I moved to Philadelphia and joined the Department of Preventive and Restorative Sciences at UPenn. And we've been actually embracing CATCOM technology and providing these 
uh, tools, very powerful tools for our students from first year to uh, master programs and so on. And I think that we need to have things very clear in order that works in everyone's hands. We need to have protocols that work for everyone. Okay, if it's a technique that it's extremely difficult, that it has a high um, failure rate, I think that's nothing that we want to implement. So uh, I want to go on, on, on the safe side of, of the laminate veneers today, okay? We have a mission at Penn, which is integrating all these new technologies, as Jim was saying, not only in education, but in research. We want to make sure that we really use materials and protocols that are uh, safe for our patients. And uh, that's what we like to do, try to combine clinical implementation of the technologies with the education and the research. And that's part of what I would like to um, share with everyone here today. I always want to give credit to my mentor, Professor Marcus Blatz, who invited me uh, six years ago to Penn Dental Medicine. Learned so much from him, keep learning from him every, every day. And uh, Dr. Blatz had this uh, vision of implementing CAD CAM technology, but without compromising quality. And that's something sad we've seen. We've seen that many clinicians just invest on CAD CAM systems, chair side systems, and actually the level of dentistry doesn't improve, it actually goes down. Why? Because we haven't put the time that we need to learn the processing of these different ceramic materials to actually have something final for the patient that it's very high quality. So from this perspective is that we work with chair side CAD CAM dentistry, and of course we keep working with lab side CAD CAM. So uh, sometimes I feel even the industry goes too fast and some of the clinicians haven't had the time to really learn how to design, how to polish, how to place, how to modify. And maybe at the beginning, the quality of what you're delivering chair side is not what you were uh, looking for. So I hope some of the tips that I share can help you um, raise that level if it's chair side. And of course, if you're working with an excellent ceramist, some tips that can really help you uh, provide the best information for that technician to do that mastery work, okay? So um, I think that the new generations of dentists are uh, all of them using these technologies and it's actually great if we use all the tools that we have in the software, like the preparation analysis tools, where I can see if I have sharp angles, if I have enough or not enough reduction, if I have undercuts. So we, we create this a habit. I'm not saying we prep perfect. No, we don't, but we check first. And when we detect those imperfections, we go back and we perfection that preparation and everything that sends out or everything that we're going to invest time designing it's a preparation that has gone through this quality control. If we make this a habit, we're going to have less repetitions, less failures, less aesthetic complications as well. Okay, so uh, that's one of the first points I would like to, to share with you. Uh, if you're using the CEREC software, for example, you have the preparation analysis tools and all the different softwares nowadays have these specific set of tools that help us make these quality control on the preps before we move to the designing phase, whether it's in-house or in an external lab. As you can see in the photo on the right side, we have multiple furnaces, different types. We're going to talk about um, those uh, important aspects as well for the best finishing of our restorations. Okay, I'm going to summarize some of the publications that we've done uh, through the last years. And this one is the current state of chair-side digital dentistry and CAD CAM materials. And as Jim was saying, um, there's so many nuances, so many new materials and techniques, and we want to be less invasive all the time, but we need to understand the indication and the contraindication of every procedure to be able to do high aesthetic dentistry safely as well. So I'm going to summarize this, and basically today I want to talk to two different targets groups. We want to talk to the clinician doing the chair-side digital workflow where we scan, design, and mill in-house and are able to finish the restoration with a smaller, more simple furnace, mostly with monolithic restorations. So shade selection, uh, thickness of the restoration, selection of the proper cement shade are very important things to be able to be predictable in that uh, workflow. The other one where we're talking with a collaboration between the clinician having CAD-CAM technology and a, an expert lab using the same CAD-CAM 
software and milling for the production of the restorations. Because as a prosthodontist doing chair side, I understand my limitations. And some cases are straightforward and I make them in one or two days, chair side, no problem. Or I see possible difficulties in a specific case where I go and scan and then I send this, but also I send a lot of good information on shade selection and abutment shade and, and so on. So the ceramics can do their work as good as they have. So I'll be sharing both type of cases, trying to share some of the tips and tricks maybe that could be helpful. So um, today, what we can say is that everyone here, uh, if you're in the clinical scenario, you got to have an intraoral scan. We've been working with these for 11 and a half years now. And uh, when we started, we were powdering and it was like one restoration at the time. Nowadays, we do full mouth rehabilitations. We do um, anterior aesthetic veneers without any type of model or at least with any type of conventional impression impression to create a stone model. Of course, we need to be very detailed in our intraoral scan, making sure that once we finish scanning, we go and review that scan, magnifying the image and making sure that inside the prep, there's no missing data at all. If I have some missing data in the palatal surface of posterior teeth where I'm not making any veneers, that's fine. I don't wanna go crazy and go back and rescan every single corner of the full arch, but where I'm working, my abutment teeth need to be scanned perfectly. That will help the final um, fit of my mill ceramic restorations for both chair side and lab. So this is another of the uh, concepts that I wanted to explain here today. We're gonna be very detailed on the abutment teeth. Okay, so nowadays we do full mouth rehabilitations with more partial coverage restorations and way less full coverage restorations. Our concept today is to do full coverage restorations, meaning crowns, only when I'm replacing existing crowns, but or I have endodontic retreated teeth. But the rest of the restorations we go for partial coverage because we can design and mill, and then we can adhesively bond these different materials. And uh, as a patient, I have four laminate veneers, partial coverage, my palatal surface are intact. So that's what we wanna provide to our patients every time that it is possible. So our workflows have changed and we don't use any alginate anymore because we don't really need it. We can 3D print those study models, we can 3D print those digital workshops, and I'm gonna show you the planning sequence for laminate veneers. So if I have a patient that comes to me for aesthetic concerns to improve their smile, I need to make sure that my design goes accordingly to their face. If I'm sending this to an external lab, I need to provide my lab with some images so they know if there's any cant, if there's any deviation from the midline, if there's any buccal corridor that it's, uh, needs to be improved, we gotta share those informations to whoever is designing. In my case, I design sometimes myself or I send it to labs as well. So we need to have a clean and easy protocol for photos. I know in the private practice, we don't have all the time we need to take all those fancy photos all the time. So with your smartphone, with a clean background, white gray wall in the back, I'm gonna take a photo with the patient smiling, a high smile where I can see the incisal edges, okay? You can also take a lateral photo and a 12 o'clock if you want to use one of the different applications like the DSD app to correlate that intraoral scan. So the first step, as a minimum, a photo, a facial photo in smile, seeing the patient's eyes and incisal edges of the maxillary teeth. Once we have that, we're gonna go and make our intraoral scans, okay? Here, this patient is concerned about her diastemas, her um, black triangles. She doesn't want to go through any type of ortho or Invisalign, which would be a great benefit for us, the restorative dentist, later on. So we want to provide less invasive dentistry here, but we understand that sometimes that's uh, 
kind of complicated because we know that every indirect restoration needs a path of insertion, okay? So the only reason I'm prepping teeth now is to provide a path of insertion and make sure that I have the adequate minimal thickness for the materials, okay? But the idea of prepping full coverage crowns is not on my top of priorities, okay? I want to think about always creating a path of insertion and providing sufficient thickness for the restorative materials that I select. So here you see pre-op STL files, upper, lower, buckle scan, and then with the photos, we go ahead and correlate this with the patient's face. There are many different softwares today. I don't want to talk about, about the softwares, but what I want to make sure uh, we all understand is the benefit of doing this digital wax up facially driven because I can know where the incisal edge needs to be, where the curvature of the smile line needs to be positioned so it looks in harmony with the face of the, face of the patient. I'm not saying this needs to be perfect, totally symmetric all the time, but it needs to be in harmony with the structures, okay? So we need to have a software that lets us uh, incorporate a portrait of the patient, the SDL file of the pre-op situation, and from there, I'm going to start aligning them and doing the digital wax. So the cool thing is that nowadays for laminate veneers, we basically only use monolithic materials with minimal cutbacks and micro layering where needed. But in many situations, we have a and not ceramic block to monolithic materials using these libraries from natural teeth. So here you can see how I'm aligning the photos to the infrared scan. So we go ahead and diagnose. Do I need to treat only the centrals? Do I need to share the space with the laterals? Would the case make it easier and better if I involve the canines? So this helps me explain the patient the treatment and also gives me the option to explain the patient the limitations. Many times patients come to us with extremely high expectations and maybe a set of six veneers from six to 11 won't solve their concerns uh, or their thoughts about the aesthetics, right? So here we can click on 2D, 4D, 6D, explain them, show them in a 2D. And once the patient approves the, the concept, then we can go for a three-dimensional wax up, okay? I'm not saying every clinician needs to go through this process, but at least needs to make a clean intraoral pre-op scan, a clean set of portraits on smile, so the lab technician or designer has the tools to correlate these together and come out with a plan. What you see in the photo on the right, it's the STL file from the um, software with the six veneers planned, okay? So this is a first mock-up. This mock-up is just an additive mock-up, okay? In some clinical situations with severe rotation of teeth, this mock-up might need to be a little bit bulky because we're not prepping at this moment yet. Okay, so once we have this, we're going to 3D print this model and then we're going to create a nice potty matrix, a silicon guy with a light body, mm -hmm, a two-step, so we can really clone this design into the patient's face with the mock-up, okay? Why? Because if this is nice, I can scan it and then I can just replicate it with the final material. So this is just a resin printed model, including the digital WhatsApp, a PBS. And then I go and place the bisacryl, and you can see how nice this incisal edge position fits the patient's lower lip, smile, how it has a harmony on the curvature when the patient is in smile, okay? So this is a mock-up. I think that this is a mandatory step in order to plan high aesthetic laminate veneers. If I want to rush it and I just sit the patient and start prepping and scanning, and I'm going to be having problems designing because until that point, I'm going to see that I'm missing reduction or that I reduce more than necessary. And that's where you start battling on the design in the software without getting the results that you need. So this step, it's a little more time consuming at the beginning, but it will streamline the process once you start the therapy, OK? 
Okay. Once you have this mock-up approved by the patient or you fine-tune it with suplex discs in the mouth, adding a little bit of flowable in an incisal edge or a corner, once the patient likes it, then you go ahead and scan it again. Okay. This is what we have worked with for many years as a biocopy. As you see, this mock-up is very clean. Let me run the video again. It's very clean in the cervical region, okay? We want to make sure that that potty matrix is well coated so we can reduce all the visceral excess in the interproximal surfaces and the uh, uh, over the gum so this information is close to the final outcome that we want, okay? save this and then we're going to share this to the lab or if we're doing it we're going to select biocopy as design mode to maintain this nice shape and position of the teeth okay so that was the first phase of my lecture today and it's about planning about e using the digital technologies and as you can see it's not time consuming it's practical it needs to be practicable to be user friendly Portraits, patient smiling, nice intraoral scans, pre-op, send that to the lab, to your designer, get things together, okay? Now, we're gonna move into prepping. And nowadays, as Tim said, we wanna prep less, we wanna maintain more enamel because we know that the long-term bonding to enamel still is superior when we compare it to dentin. With this, I'm not saying that if I have a patient with exposed dentin, I won't classify it as a candidate for veneers. Yes, we can bond to dentin as well, but if I have the choice, I will try to maintain as much enamel as possible. So Dr. Blatz and I designed this per block of Brassler after checking hundreds and probably even thousands of preps and checking the most common mistakes we all do while prepping, okay? And we think that having specific instruments are very helpful for raising the level of your dental care okay so with this block we can do veneers which is today's topic but of course you can do full coverage crowns inlays onlays overlays combinations like bond lays between veneer and onlays and everything is taught for cat cam okay everything used this first will give you smooth transitions fine diamonds for smooth surfaces that will make your scanning better and your milling and fitting better as well okay so um, if you're interested you can visit their website and you can order one of these blogs what we've done is think about enamel think about bonding think about the biology part not only the technical part of cat cam so we understand that the enamel thickness in the cervical part of the tooth is only 0.3 that's why our first bird that you see on the left side has a depth cutting of only 0.3 millimeters I've seen many other kids with much more aggressive depth cutter, cutters, but that's actually guiding me to remove all the enamel and that's not what we want to do. Then when we wanna prep the shoulder of the veneer, okay, I wanna have it very homogeneous and soft and rounded, but also thin. So we can prep this of 0.3 millimeters, but with a smooth transition. We don't wanna have a sharp, angle in that burr and then the third burr that we have it's to smooth the line angles within the veneer preparation and many times with the light in the clinical chair we don't see those line angles on the on the prep only when we are in the software with all the magnification so this yellow ultra fine diamond burr will help you smooth out all the transitions on your prep all the line angles the transition between facial and incisal so everything is smooth. The last part is not for today's topic, that's a football for the palatal aspect of full coverage crowns, but anyway, uh, we know that any ceramic restoration will be as strong as its weakest link. So many times you have a lovely crown prep on the facial incisal, but without sufficient reduction on the palatal or not ideal reduction, uh, and then that could lead you to problems as well, okay? so. We need to have the proper burrs. We need to have the proper instruments to manage the tissue. Because if you deliver the nicest set of veneers made by the more skillful technician in the world, but the patient comes back a month after with a recession and you're showing part of the root of that tooth or the junction between the veneer and the tooth, the patient is not going to be happy. So we've made those mistakes. 
What I want to say here is that we need to be very gentle with the tissue because I don't really know which sub tissue will react worse than I want. So I only try to use the triple zero retraction cord and use this smooth instrument to pack the cord and also try to reduce the amount of time that those cords are inside the sulcus. Also, I want to have an instrument to protect the soft tissue while I'm refining the margins because my technician wants a smooth margin, I want a clean finish line, but also I want no bleeding. I cannot damage the area and we want to be slightly subgingival, 0.5 to hide that junction. So I think we need these instruments not only to retract but also to protect the soft tissues, okay? And this is a very old slide I have in my presentations but it shows that all the transitions need to be smooth so there's no over milling, okay? If we have smooth transitions, the burr of the CATCAM system will be able to mill the intaglio as smooth as possible, okay? So I wanna go quickly through this to go through clinical cases, but we know that we don't need anything more aggressive than a medium grip, and we like to always finish everything with a fine. The extra fine is the one that we want to use to refine the prep, the, the line angles mostly. And then we can see that we can finish with a very nice and smooth margin to be able to have very nice adaptation, okay? This is some uh, SEM photos we did of the burrs of the CEREC milling machine as an example. So what we try to do with this burr block is to match the dimensions of the burrs that we use in the patient's mouth and the burrs that the milling machine uses for the production of the restorations, okay? A smooth prep is great, will give you better marginal adaptation. And you can see here the V-dynamic, we really like the V-dynamic hybrid ceramic. I think it's one of the most accurate materials for milling because it doesn't go through any thermal processing after it's been milled. And you can see here that we are able to achieve marginal adaptation of even six microns, which is extraordinary. We are the weakest link when we prep veneers and with these tips and with these instruments and with this knowledge, we can provide really nice marginal adaptation, okay? So now not going into the material classification today, but I just wanna show you a few clinical cases with some tips. So my favorite material for laminate veneers are the Vita Trilux Forte blocks, a felspathic ceramic block that it's multicolor. Okay, you see them on the left side. Okay, these materials on the left side have the benefit of being multicolor. I'm going to show you some examples with the Vita Trilux Forte that you see on the top of the screen. Okay, so this material is uh, easy to mill and finish with polishing or glazing. But the nice thing is that the color saturation is inside the block. It's a multicolor block. So you have more saturation of color towards the base and more translucency towards the insightful edge. If you have a patient that is looking for very white laminate veneers, then we will go for a Vita Mark II, which is the same phosphatic ceramic material but in a monochromatic, okay? Because there's no saturation of the shade to diffuse, those Vita Mark II blocks are monochromatic. If you have a shade like a 1M2, for example, which is a very nice bright shade, but a little natural as well to match the posteriors and the premolars, then that's where I always go with the Vita Trilux Forte because the color comes within the restoration and it's not only painted on the outside, okay? So this is a practical case. You can see here discoloration, diastemas, and uneven soft tissues. So we go through all our planning as I explained you with the protocol as I showed you before. Now we go ahead and make the mock-up. Patient has approved the mock-up and then we just go here and if we're not prepping the same day of the mock-up, we use the same bisacryl, the same uh, silicon index, and just put some more bisacryl on the silicon matrix, place it again, and this is going to be a prep guide. This is a preparation guide for the veneers, okay? You see there's some excess on the cervical, 
that's not the mock-up that the patient was wearing. This is just to place it and then start prepping on top. With this, I can manage perfectly the thickness of my philosophic veneer, which I want to be 0 0.3 millimeters in the cervical part and ideally have a homogeneous thickness between 0 0.3 and 0 0.5 or up to one millimeter if the case is more additive. But I want to make sure that my prep provides me with homogeneous thickness. So you can see the burr here. I go ahead and mark those three depth cutters on the facial aspect of the tooth in the three thirds. And then I use a pencil and mark those depth cuts, okay? Why? Because I don't wanna keep going deeper, but I wanna make sure I make a homogeneous facial reduction. So here we go with our red line, diamond burr, and just prep the three planes of the facial aspect and make some incisal reduction also of one millimeter so we can have a homogeneous thickness on the incisal edge. We don't make veneers that wrap around the palatal surface, but our veneers always cover the facial and sit on the incisal edge. This will also make it easier for the lab technician or yourself to create a very nice aesthetic outcome of that incisal third of the tooth, okay? So this is the second step of the preparation for the laminate veneers. And then I will just go ahead and mark the margin. As I said, it's very important to place a triple zero retraction cord and try to finish with that margin in the cervical part at the gum level when the soft tissue is retracted and the cord is in place, okay? This is a nice balance, so you can scan it clearly, but also you don't create an irreversible soft tissue recession afterwards, okay? Also, when we use felspathic ceramics like Vita, Trilux Porteblocks, we understand this is the most translucent material. If one of these abutments is very discolored, then I might need to go to a more opaque material. But here you can see the four teeth have a very nice color for vital teeth. So felspathic ceramic at 0 0.5 millimeter thickness will work perfectly. It's basically creating that ideal shell of enamel. That's what the felspathic material will be doing. And always remember when you're selecting the shade, not only have this photo, but evaluate the same photo in black and white scale, because I want to see the value, how bright or how grayish this is going to be. And I see that this is one of the most common mistakes we do. We don't evaluate the shade with the value scale. 3D Master Shade Guide comes in order for value, from high value to low value in those five groups. The classical, you need to understand the concept, okay, to always make sure you're communicating the value to select the proper shade, and this will help you avoid repetitions, okay? You can see a screenshot here of a Vita Trilux for the block. You can see the four different layers. I always try to um, angle the block a little bit so <clears throat> you see a smooth transition between the different layers for more chromatic only in the cervical third and more translucent towards the incisal edge. And then we will go ahead and create a stain and glaze. I don't want to work much on the texture because we are actually cloning that texture from the library of the natural teeth here. If you're a very skillful ceramist, maybe you go for that. In my case, I like to clone it from the digital planning steps. There are many types of uh, presentations of glaze. With the Vita Accent Plus, you have all the options that you want. <clears throat> you can have a paste, you can have a, a liquid, you can have a, even a spray. And I like this one, which is a finishing agent because it gives you a less uh, thick glaze and a more natural glaze. So for all those uh, dental technicians, ramis, <clears throat> if you haven't tried this one, I really recommend it because it's the most natural surface I've seen after trying multiple systems of glazing. Okay, so we know this veneer is uh, in a way brittle before bonding, so we need to optimize bonding. Here I'm going to etch with hydrofluoric acid for 60 seconds, okay? So we etch minimum of one minute, no more than two minutes. That's a perfect range between 
one minute to two minutes of hydrochloric acid etching for feldspathic ceramics. I'm going to wash it and dry it. Okay, I can always <clears throat> put it in the ultrasonic, in distilled water or alcohol to clean every debris of the crystals of the residues in the intaglio surface of the veneer before going with the silane. We use the Panavia V5 resin cement and it has the ceramic primer plus which is also a conventional silane coupling agent for glass ceramics like Vita Trilux Forte. And then we need to understand that the optimization of bonding is to both surfaces to the ceramic, as I explained now, but also to the enamel. So enamel needs to be always etched with phosphoric acid for 20 seconds. After thoroughly washing and drying gently, I'm going to apply a bonding agent. Every time you want to bond veneers, make sure you're using a system that has a bonding agent to the tube. Not all the bonding agents need to be light cured, okay? That's a different story, but always apply bonding agent and use a cement that comes with the bonding agent and then we will apply the bonding agent thin it out light cure it if it needs to be light cured if it doesn't then you can just thin it air thin it and practice the insertion of the veneer these are very thin as you see so we need to make sure that we know how we're going to position the veneer on the abutment tooth then I will apply the uh, cement inside the veneer, making sure it's a homogeneous layer. I don't want to exaggerate on the amount, but I also don't want to have very few um, cement having areas without cement. So just distribute it nicely and start bonding. And then you can see here how nicely we're able to clone that uh, morphology from the planning software through the processing of the porcelain laminate veneer. So these are Vita Trilux Forte Felspathic Ceramic Blocks made with a chair-side CAD-CAM system and glazed with a Vita Accent Plus. And this is my go-to protocol when I have nice color of the abutment teeth. Okay, so we also know that sometimes we have more complications regarding the shade of the abutments. In this case, I have an endotreated teeth, but the rest of the restorations, I want to make veneers. As I said, today in 2021, we only go for full coverage crowns when we are treating teeth with endo or with previous crowns. The rest of the teeth, we want to restore them with partial coverage. So here, we want to show you the same technique, triple zero retraction cord, mark and define the margin at that position with the tissue um, retracted protecting with the instrument from Rattler and you can see how nice when we use this technique of prepping over the mock-up with the depth cutters we can have a homogeneous reduction making sure we have both things one maintain enamel as a priority but second maintain material thickness okay we need to have 0 0.5 thickness homogeneous in the facial aspect so we can kneel and cement the veneer without any um, fracturing during the processing of these restorations. But in this case, I have a crown and next to this crown, I have teeth for laminate veneers. The shade of this tooth is not exactly the same. You can see the cervical part is this color. So we have silicate ceramics which come in different levels of translucencies. So for this silicate ceramic, I would like to use always the lower translucency option, okay? The translucency, uh, the translucent block, if it's Trinity, for example, not the high translucency, because I want to use that, let's say, lower level of translucency to mask this slightly discolored tooth, and because these restorations have different thicknesses, they have different sizes as well, I want to use something that is less translucent. So if you're using the Trinity, every uh, silicate ceramic needs to be hydrofluoric acid edge only for 20 seconds, okay? There's less content of glass, so you need less time of the hydrofluoric acid, and this needs also a silane coupling agent. And if we don't respect those 20 seconds and apply more, it could be detrimental to the material. So we want to make sure 
we have a timer and we just limit ourselves for 20 seconds of hydrochloric acid etching. And here you can see this is a bleach shade. This is a combination case where we have one crown surrounded by five veneers, but you don't see the difference because here I want to use a material in a presentation that it's less translucent and that will help me when I have these differences both in shade and in the dimension. Okay, and now I want to transition to the Connect workflow where I work with a lab technician, a ceramist. And this is a really nice case we published already. Uh, it's in the Compendium magazine. If everyone wants any of the PDFs, please contact me on social media. I can just share you any of the PDF of the, of the publications. And this uh, is a collaboration between our team at Penn and Telmo Santos from Brazil. He's a ceramist from Belo Horizonte, Brazil. So you get this type of case. This is challenging. Do I want to do crowns to every tooth? No, that's not what we want to do in 2021. So here we need to combine between the type of prep and the selection of the material to be able to help this patient with this high complex situation. Okay. So we go through the same procedure as I showed you before of the DSD to analyze because here we have huge diastemas and I want to make sure these veneers or if I need to make a crown, I know exactly the proportions width and length. So same protocol, DSD, wax up, digital wax up, printed model, potty matrix, mock up, scan it if you like it and then use it as a prep guide. Okay. So this is a limitation of laminate veneers. I want to show this left photo here. The centrals, whenever you need to move the midline more than one millimeter to a side, to the left or the right, you need to prep full coverage crown. Okay, because we also need to push that tissue and we need to come more from subgingival. We need to come more from underneath the tissue to be able to support the tissue, okay? So these cases with severe sub-tissue loss and very big diastemas, more than two millimeters, I need a, I need a crown. I need to sacrifice more tissue uh, structure, okay? And then we go ahead and design the restorations. So here we use the connect workflow. I'm just scanning doing my mock-up, sending that information, and then Telmo is taking over. He's using the in-lab software, and here I mark an initial design following the sub tangible contours that I need, and then he's going to optimize this design in the ExoCAD software with the use of this type of library. So with these libraries, even the high-end ceramist like Telmo is working more in a monolithic way because he can have these libraries of natural teeth with natural texture and he can basically stamp the texture on the initial design that I create. What I'm telling Telmo in the initial design is like, look Telmo, this is the um, support that I want to give to the tissue. This is the position of the interproximal contact point regarding the position of the bone because the technician many times doesn't have access to the clinical setting and they cannot see this situation. So I help with an initial design limiting Telmo to the facial aspect of the restoration but everything that needs to go in relation with the tissue that's something that I design myself. So you can see on the photo on the right the cervical part of the tooth that it's in a light brown color that hasn't been changed. Telmo is enhancing the facial aspect with the software that has the possibility of working with multiple types of um, libraries of natural teeth. So you can see here a very nice final outcome and this is the Vita Suprinity block. Again when I have centrals with crowns, laterals and canines with veneers, I don't go with the highest translucency level of the material because even they can be milled from the same block due to the difference of the size and 
shade of the abutment tooth, they can look slightly different. So having this option when those plastic materials is not my best option due to discoloration, I want to go with these other alternatives. Okay, so that's basically our protocol working with um, laminate veneers from Felspathics to um, zirconia reinforced silicate ceramics like uh, Vita Suprinity. Then we have zirconia, we have new generations of zirconia, we have the um, Vita XT zirconia, which is a 5% ITRA stabilized zirconia, which is has more of a cubic face, less tetragonal, it's very aesthetic. Okay, so it's a material that could be used as well for laminate veneers or for this type of combination cases. Okay, so here I'm going to show you a very complex case in my opinion. This patient came here for treating number nine and the diastema. He had a previously treated two, the number nine with an over contoured crown and he didn't like the diastema. So we go with the same protocol and you can see here that the crown is bigger than number eight, the diastema is there. So we need to be very, very clear of the space distribution. Space distribution is a key element for laminate veneers. Here I'm able to mark the facial midline, to mark the distance that I have from missile to missile of the laterals. I can distribute this, that space divided by two and then understand that I would need to treat number eight in order to have symmetry between the central incisors, okay? And I want to explain how I like to communicate these more challenging cases with the lab technician. So this is a case done the laboratory part by Michael Bergler. Michael is a master dental technician and he um, directs the uh, treatment planning center and the CATCAM ceramic center, which was previously known at Penn Dental Medicine. So even though we're working in the same place, I want to give him the best type of information for him to make the decisions of the materials. Here, I'm using the Vita Easy Shade, okay, which is a spectrophotometer, and it's really helpful. There's plenty of evidence that it helps you select shade better. But also, here, I'm taking intraoral photos, as I do with every single case, as I've shown you. But I want to make sure that I provide Michael with the information together, so it's really um, user-friendly, and he can really be benefited by having this information. So what we do is that we download in our smartphone the Vita Mobile Assist app. Once you have the app, you have the photo on your uh, iPhone or, or Samsung or whatever smartphone you have, then you're going to connect this to the Easy Shade by Bluetooth and then you're going to have the measurement of the tooth in your phone as well. And then you can put this together, which is the photo you took and the information of the shade on the different thirds. It gives you the shade both on the Vita Trilux, I'm, I'm sorry, on the 3D Master shade guide scale and in the classical, okay? So for block selection, I always go for the middle third. You can see here that the middle third in yellow, it says A2. So we're gonna use a block that it's A2 or whatever is closest to 2R 1.5 and then playing with the um, saturation of the cervical third, we can move that for the translucency of the incisal plus adding some stains, okay? So here I prep a very conservative veneer and I remove the existing crown and just smooth out the transitions. I want to pack the retraction cord, refine at the level of the gum with the retraction cord in place, and then Michael starts designing two veneers from outside to inside, because we want these two veneers to be as symmetric as possible, not only in length and width, but also on thickness, because we want to use Vita Trilux for the block. Here, this is what it's called the rapid layer technology. It's basically a sandwich, having a shell of elspathic ceramic on top, which is the nicest one, and having a zirconia crown and a coping on the inside, which can help you hide any type of discoloration. So we've done plenty of studies about this technique at Penn. We will follow up more than five years now with very high success rate. There's no risk of chipping or 
layering and you can use a full digital approach. So here Michael made this custom coping that follows the shape of my veneer preparation. So the two veneers on top, one is going to be cemented on a zirconia coping and the other one is going to be cemented on the natural tooth. Okay. You can see the coping here. This is not a translucent zirconia. This is actually a conventional 3Y uh, itrostabilized zirconia because I want it to be very thin, strong, and opaque. And then we go with the nice flat ceramic, which is the Felstatic ceramic block. We need to know how to bond to zirconia. That's Dr. Vlad's specialty. So APC, air upgrade zirconia. The Felstatic, you're going to etch it for one minute with hydrochloric acid, as I explained. And you've got to make sure that for the zirconia side, you put a primer that contains MDP, not your conventional siding. Okay, the nice thing about Panavia V5 is that the same ceramic primer plus has a conventional siding, coping agent, and a MDP primer for V zirconia or titanium, as we've talked in other webinars. Okay, and then the Panavia V5 resin system. This is an extra oral cementation technique after air abrading the coping, applying the ceramic primer plus, after etching the veneer, applying the same ceramic primer plus. And then I can do this extra oral cementation, removing all the excess, and it's much easier. So you can see two laminate veneers here, Vita Trilux Forte, one is delivered over a natural tooth, and the other one was delivered over a zirconia coping to try to work and improve not only the shade but also the dimension the physical property of the um, preparation very quickly this is one of our latest uh, research and it shows the newest uh, version of the panavia this would be the panavia sa cement universal which has the um, mdp inside the cement is showing very good bond strength compared to the gold standard panavia v5 for veneers, I still use the gold standard because I like to have the different try-ins and I like to have the ceramic primer plus to the application to the ceramic side. Okay, but this is just showing us that the technology on the cements is also improving. If you have zirconia, if it's crown and bridge, you can use glass ionomer, uh, any type of self-etching, self-adhesive cement. But if you want to start using zirconia in less invasive designs like veneers, overlays, not going for full coverage, then you need to follow the APC concept, okay? And here I just want to show you a technique on the preparation when you have big diastemas, okay? Here we do the digital wax up from 6 to 11. You can see how big the diastemas are between 6 and 7 and between 9 and 10, okay? So let me go back one photo here. You see a failing composite between nine and 10. And I'm not really sure if this is a candidate for veneer. So we gotta go through this digital WhatsApp and invest the time here, making sure that we can check the proportion, what shape of teeth, what size of teeth would be better to be able to um, solve the issue of the space distribution. So here, when we're prepping this teeth, we're maintaining veneers. We're not touching the palatal aspect, but I want to show you here the prep of tooth number 9 and 10. Here we are going around the mesial part of 9 and, I'm sorry, the distal part of 9 and the mesial part of 10, okay? Because I want to make sure that the veneer is wrapping around that diastema. So when we are designing, we can come from the palatal aspect from the palatal side and push the tissue and be able to avoid having a black triangle. Okay, this is very important. Between the centrals, this is one millimeter diastema. I can maintain the preparation on a facial aspect. Okay, and the other point that I want to show you here is what we call the elbow of the veneer preparation. For example, here you see number eight on the distal part the junction between the shoulder in the distal and the cervical, that's what we call the elbow. Let's see it here on number seven in the mesial. The junction between cervical and 
proximal surface, this is the elbow. That elbow needs to be prepped as palatally as possible so we can come from more palatal and be able to support the tissue and avoid black triangles, okay? So those are mo most of my tips and tricks for veneers. And I think that these can help you reduce um, on aesthetic outcomes. Sometimes we want to be too conservative and keep the shoulder too facial. And then the technician doesn't have that vertical and horizontal running room to be able to provide an ideal design in the inner proximal and support the papilla. Okay, so nowadays we have these newer generations of zirconia, and also we have these protocols for bonding to zirconia. I still have a favorite material which is phospathic ceramic but this is also nice to have another alternative maybe for combination cases crowns and veneers you can also use these uh, extra translucent zirconia material so the preparation design is key so the design in the CATM system can help us solve these issues of space distribution and you can see that the results of the soft tissue around zirconia are extremely nice. If we polish well the zirconia on the cervical aspect, not glaze, that cervical one millimeter, if we keep it polished only, we can have a very nice soft tissue adaptation. So we always say that the tissue is the issue, and I think that is still current nowadays. So I hope this overview of laminate veneers with different materials can uh, help you when you are uh, seeing your, your, your next patient, you're selecting the material, but make sure that the planning phase is clear and uh, we can have the specific tools to be able to prep as we want for um, chair-side CATCAM dentistry or lab-side CATCAM technologies. I gave a past a webinar with Vita North America about um, Vita Ambria, a pressable material, and there we show how Telmo Santos does the um, cat wax technique, milling these wax patterns and pressing them as well. So if you don't have the, the milling uh, possibility, that's also a nice uh, thing to do if you cannot mill uh, dry zirconia or any other limitation as well. But you can see here the existing failing composite between eight and nine has disappeared we have these nice six veneers and we have the support of the tissue okay this takes a little bit of time it's not as quickly as the brochures of the cat cam systems tell you but at the end if this is supposed to last for 10 years i really don't care if it took me one or two days for finishing the case or one more appointment at the end is the final outcome that has more value and here, just to point out something, I know we always want to provide the patient with the best quality dentistry, and sometimes we see these recessions, and then many patients say, you know what, I don't have any insurance anymore, I don't want to go through a soft tissue grafting, it's painful, I had one before, I didn't like it. Well, here we have now the tools to use these photos and place them on the design software to visualize the smile line, okay? And you can do this before prepping. So here, we can discuss with the patient and tell the patient, look, we are going to simulate the cervical part of the root on that part of the recession on your canine, and number six, which is the, the, the biggest recession, but everything is going to be covered by your upper lip. So these tools are very helpful for diagnosing, treatment planning, and this can also help you get more case acceptance, okay? So we can use these tools before, for explaining the patient the treatment or during the procedure, as you can see it here, okay? So this is also monolithic translucent zirconia. And these are all veneers. So I've never thought I would be doing this when I was first introduced to zirconia, but it's nice to see that the development of the materials is improving and now we have more options. It's not that you need to only use one material for everything. Our concept is to use the best material per clinical case, okay? 
So you can see here, as we planned, there's no exposure. This is the highest mile I could get for the patient and actually was not necessary to get those soft tissue grafts in those areas. So remember, technology is here to help you, okay? It helps you communicate with your patients and enhance the final outcome. Still in 2021, none of our ceramic restorations are, um, I don't know the word, but not at risk of a chipping or um, fracture or uh, de-cementation. So during the day, the patient will collaborate while the patient is asleep, cannot collaborate, right? So we always prescribe an occlusal guard. Nowadays, we start scanning for planning, we deliver the restorations, we take our scanner again, scan it again, and then we can 3D print or mill a nice surgical um, night guard for protection of these restorations. Few slides to finish. Pay more attention to details, okay? And these details start from the planning, from the pre op scans, from the potty matrix to create your bisacryl mock up, and so on. Of course, through the prep and the design phase and the cementation phase as well. Okay, work more on your hand skills. I think that the three years that I spent in the PROS program doing lab, that's where I really improved. Okay, so the more we spend polishing a ceramic, cutting a sprue, adding a little bit of ceramic, staining, glazing, practicing cementing in a, in a model or something with an extra crown we have, that's the only way we can really improve um, the level of dental care that we provide to our patients. Other thing very important, use material specific instruments. I show you the benefits of our bird block. I think it's great, it's very helpful. But not only that, you know, we need to make sure that we're using instruments that don't harm the material. Make sure you have a polishing set for zirconia, you have a polishing set for PMMA. Make sure that if you're using suprinity, um, zirconia reinforced silicate ceramic, you have a polishing set for that material so you don't affect it. Many times if we have a complication, we go directly and blame the material. But I would like to ask, what instruments were we using? At what RPM, at what speed? Was it with water, without water? Because many times we are the ones that affect the ceramic materials, okay? And even though we were talking a little bit about chair-side ceramic, I'd like to finish with this. Deliver what makes you proud, okay? Let's make sure that we don't get rushed just because it's a same day case. Let's make sure that the final outcome is very nice. It's very good and you really feel proud of that uh, result that you gave to your patients, okay? So as I said before, I shared a few of my um, publications in the lecture. If anyone wants the uh, PDF files, please uh, you can send me a, a message on Instagram. There's my account there. Also, there's my email. If you need any any consulting, if there's anything I can help you with, uh, please feel free to contact me. So uh, once again, Jim, thank you so much for your time and Vida North America for the invitation. It's always a pleasure to share what we do with your materials. Thank you. Oh, you're so welcome. Uh, great presentation as always. Uh, as everyone can see, the uh, if you need to get a hold of uh, Dr. Caneo, you can do so. Uh, now, let me uh, go over just a few more things, and then we'll go to the uh, question uh, and answer. Can you, Jim. you can't hear me? Yes, now I do, and I'm seeing your screen. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, thank you, everyone. We're, we're, before we get to the uh, Q&A, uh, let me just go over a few more things uh, with this. Uh, so, again, if you are a... Um, Want, looking to get uh, a recording, we are going to record this. This is um, going to be on our social media website. Uh, you can visit us at www.vitanorthamerica.com slash courses on our Facebook, on our uh, YouTube, North America YouTube channel, and you'll be able to revisit uh, Dr. Conejo's uh, workshop. Uh, we are uh, going to provide CE. If you're looking for CE, we have the ability to give uh, ADA-CERP uh, CE. 
So you should receive a, an email. You'll need to fill that out and then get it back to our uh, CE department, our marketing department. And then we look forward to uh, more workshops, more webinars from Dr. Conejo. We have several um, in the future. We, you can also get a hold of us at the, at the help desk here at Vita North America Help. Uh, this is the information for contacts here if you'd like. And then if you need to reach out to any of our, your local uh, VITA reps, we have uh, numerous of uh, numerous uh, sales reps across the country, U.S. and Canada, that you can get a hold of us. Uh, Dr. Caneo, of course, is uh, one of our favorite uh, uh, lecturers because he, he has such a vast knowledge from the clinical side, but he also does uh, hands-on uh, laboratory work as well, as he described. So. We've got uh, several more webinars scheduled with Dr. Conejo for the remaining of the year, uh, August 5th, September 2nd, November 16th. So please uh, check those out as well. And then we have uh, finally the Q&A. So if Dr. Conejo, if you're ready, uh, let me get to the questions. And the first one is, um, they're asking, uh, basically, you don't use a two-chord technique when it comes to veneers. A single, um, triple, zero, right? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great question. And um, if I can avoid it, I try to avoid it all the time, okay? If there's a previous restoration, if there was a, a decay in an area that I had to go slightly uh, more subchangeable Jim then there yes I would apply a second chord but just to that area mm -hmm. what I see many times is that when we just go and pack a first chord to every prep then we uh, just pack a second chord to every prep and we leave that for a while and maybe the provisional is not as perfect in the cervical third when you come and you try in your veneers there's actually a slight recession and that's a failure from my point of view. So I'm, in a way, very respectful with the soft tissue. As I said during the lecture, I don't really know which of the different periodontums will be more sensitive, depending if it's thin or thick. You never know what corner is going to actually recede or so. So I just try to avoid it when I can. Of course, as I said before, if there's, let's say, one of the six teeth I'm working needs a double cord, I will pack the double cord with the hemostatic, remove it, dry well, and go ahead and scan immediately. So you, you try to make your CEG, CEJ, uh, your junks is your finish line um, at gingival level, right? You, you mm -hmm. usually never go sub-gingival, correct? Yeah, exactly. That, that's, that's the point. Whenever possible, when I'm in control, if there's a previous situation or decay or something, then yes, you would need a, a second cord as well stated in the question. Uh, so, where uh, where did you get your Smile Design software? Is that uh, just a yeah? I, I I use three three different options. If it's something very very simple, quick, I like the DSD app by Dr. Coachman. Digital Smile Design application. You can download it on your app or your iPhone, and you can do the 2D uh, protocol to quickly explain your patient. And also, you can pay per download of, a, of the case if you want to export that 3D uh, digital wax of as an STL. Okay, that's one option. The other option that I like is basically using the uh, InLab software or the ExoCAD software. But there are many of the softwares now that you can incorporate the portrait of the patient. This portrait needs to be in Smile where you can see the eyes and the incisal edge of the maxillary teeth. Hopefully a nice high smile. So with this, we can correlate the position of the infraroral scan. The problem, Jim, is that if I don't have the image of the face, I only have a model that I can flip it around and rotate it, and I don't really know if that's the perfect orientation. Traditionally, we use the face bow, right, to transport that Cant or that 3D position of the maxilla. In the digital workflow, a good photo, frontal view, and the STL file can help you get very close. 
All right. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, when do you break the contact? You know, you got tight teeth, you're doing veneer. What's your decision making on breaking the contact point? Yeah. I, um, if there's a strong contact between teeth, I prefer to leave it on enamel and avoid to have my bonding area in that, around that area that we can have secondary carries later on. So what I try to do is leave the contact point whenever I can, but the elbow of the prep, as I said, the junction between the cervical and the proximal, I try to prep it as palatal as possible. So with that, we can provide support to the tissue, but don't even need to go in between the contact points. So if you go through the contact point, you have more variables. You need to make sure that you have an insertion axis. You are more limited, but of course it's possible. You also need to make sure that you're visualizing the junction between proximal and facial. So you smooth that line angle because many times when we open the contact, we can ha have a sharp straight transition and that's not ideal for the ceramic, okay? So if there's an existing very big black triangle the papilla has receded, then yes, I would need to go through the contact to be able to come more from the palatal aspect, as I was saying. But uh, if it's a straightforward case, like the first one, the four teeth are okay aligned, um, they are contacting, I leave the contact in two. All right, and then uh, do you have a call out for the type of burrs that you use to break that contact point, um, specific grip? Yeah. I don't want to I don't want to sound I'm sponsoring our bird block too much Jim, but uh yeah we have a, a burr that it's a fine needle very long that it helps you go through the contact without touching the proximal tooth or, or the proximal restoration always a metal matrix slide in between to make the cut without touching the neighbor tooth helps a lot but yeah we need to have those very specific instruments um for those specific needs and, and we thought about all these realities you know and slight complications that we have while we're prepping so we put the bird that solves all those all those things hopefully we can start doing more of our uh on uh, uh, in-person course of, of preparations and finishing as we've done in the past year uh, and i think that's where we can you know have a better idea of, of how to do these details yeah, we can uh, also maybe have some uh, models, some mock-up models where maybe you can simulate the preparations as well. Yeah, that would be nice. Uh, another question, uh, to try in your veneers, the question is, um, do you etch and bond the, the mock-ups? If, if you're doing a try-in, how do you position your any try-in to the patient's mouth? Sure. So they don't fall so, off. Yeah. So um, if, if I'm doing the, the, the veneer case in, in two appointments, right? So I prepped and I made a provisional with the same uh, potty matrix and the bisacryl material. Before I start prepping and during the week of provisionals, for example, patient is always rinsing with chlorhexidine, okay? Yeah, with a mouthwash with a high content of chlorhexidine to reduce the swelling and inflammation. So patient comes back. I don't anesthetize, I remove the provisional, okay, and I clean very gently with a floss, and then I use the try-in paste in the inside of the cement, which will simulate the shade of the final outcome with that color of cement, okay. Um, I used for years the um, uh, viral link uh, from Ivoclar for veneers, which is great, our link aesthetic. Now I use more the Panavia V5, which has also the trying. So there are many. Just make sure that your cement system has different options of color of cement and their respective trying paste. So it's basically a paste uh, that simulates how that restoration will look and will help you also maintain the restoration in position so the patient can smile and move around with other restorations coming down, which is very frustrating. So yes, we, we use a trying pace and I think it's important. But 
one one comment here, Jim. I don't think that the shades of the cement should solve your problems in shade communication. Okay. I think that we need to select the shade at the beginning of the appointment without dehydration. Once your preps are done, another good set of photos with the shade tabs that you want to use to see if there's a significant mismatch from what we want to accomplish and where we are standing at. And from there, we can also discuss the type of material because I know that with pelspathic ceramics at 0 0.3 or 4 millimeters, I'm not getting you from a A3.5 to a B1 in that thickness, right? So um, cement colors, are like the last alternative. If you see a slight difference between one, two, or the other, you can play with one or two color of cement. What I like to do sometimes is that the canines, I might use an A2 cement and a translucent cement on the four incisors. So that gives a little bit of difference uh, and more naturality on the final outcome. But I think it's case selection one by one on the material and then proper shade selection and you know Jim the importance and the protocols that you have and you teach on, on shade selection they are so important for veneers because we have less material thickness less chance to make these uh, extreme modifications. Yeah well well said because I, I think it's very important everyone realizes that there's no material to fit all that you have to understand the materials you're using and asking for to know whether it masks out, whether it's more translucent, what's that background, what's that canvas. So, so what well said, uh, very good information. Uh, so uh, another question, why do you use another, an extra layer of bisacryl material on top of your mock-up uh, used as a preparation guide? Um, no, it's actually that, let's say, First appointment, I took the photos, took the scans, took to the patient. Second appointment, I placed the mock-up, okay? And many cases, the patient says, you know what? I want to leave with the mock-up on. I can come tomorrow so you can remove it. I want to see my, my friends, my significant others, whatever, to see how, how they look, how I look, how, how what they think. So sometimes I created the mock-up, patient left, came back, removed the mock-up, and let's say we schedule the appointment for prepping the week after. So the patient comes and they don't have the mock-up at that appointment for the preparation, but I have my potty matrix, I take out this acryl and I create like a new mock-up. But only thing is that that new mock-up, I'm not going to be fine tuning all the cervical as I do with the real mock-up because I don't want to have any risk of touching the gum with my burr and creating a bleeding when I'm going to prep. So what you saw on that photo, and what I was saying is that here, I just place, let's say, the second mock-up, which is a prep guide that I'm going to cut out. All right, yeah, that's good. So um, there was a one case, uh, the question is, uh, I think it was the case that you had, number 10, uh, had a uh, mesial uh, composite, or, or number seven, um, mesial composite, and the question is, um, did you prep Past that composite? Did you just remove the composite uh, yeah, that's, that's and a then prep beyond it? Yeah. So um, let's think about um, a class three composite restoration that goes in the interproximal surface between uh, teeth. If that class three is not a tunnel, it doesn't go all the way through the palate, okay, then I can leave that remnant of composite, but I wanna make sure that an existing composite has tooth support on the back. If there's no support of the tooth, I will remove that composite and involve it on the tooth preparation, okay? But if there's an existing composite and there's supporting of that composite in the palatal aspect, we don't need to remove the entire, the entire part. So, uh, at the end, yes, we want to make sure that if our restoration fails, it's not because of the existing or pre-existing composite underneath it, right? But not everything needs to be removed all the time. Good inspection with loops, transillumination, uh, 
and I actually try to dislodge any, any existing restoration before to try to see the and test how, how well bonded that is. But every area of composite I leave, it needs to have support on the palatal aspect. So you mentioned about uh, using a um, a very uh, a fine diamond to smooth out your preparations. Do you ever polish the preparations? Yeah, actually. In, in the bare block, we have two types of polishers. Uh, they're actually greenies, uh, brownies and greenies, and, and they help a lot to, to polish. Sometimes the distance between the prep and the adjacent tooth or the tissue is not sufficient to get a polisher. So this ultra fine yellow burr helps you get very close to the proximal surface or to the gum without um, touching it more than, than needed the, the proximal surfaces. We understand that the red fine diamond is equivalent to the grit of the burrs in the CEREC for many milling machines. So getting crazy and prepping all the restoration all the time with an ultra fine, a yellow one, or over polishing, it won't give you more accuracy, better fit, because that's the roughness of the burr that will cut your restoration. So I want to even it with the red fine diamond burr, which has a 35 micron of, of the of the particles in the burr okay that matches what the burr in the milling machine uses what i want to make sure is that the transition lines are as polished as possible okay and then uh what's your take on uh, adhesive bonding using a rubber dam or not with or without it yeah um what do you want me to reply? Um, <laughs> you know, I always tell my students, if, if you don't place a rubber dam, we don't cement and we don't deliver those veneers. And I come back 20 minutes later, rubber dam is neat, placed perfectly. So we can be very good at isolation, at placing the rubber dam. If I don't practice, then it's going to take forever. It's probably like me trying to do an endo. I don't know how many years I haven't done an endo. Maybe it's going to be two hours and I cannot even start. But if I do it often, I become better. I become uh, used to it. And, and, and then I'm able to have a better control of the operatory field. And many times I see in different chats, in different uh, groups, oh, uh, these you know, enamic veneer debonded. Well, how was your your isolation how was your cementation process we always try to give the material the uh, the excuse of the failure but many times it's actually us not you know controlling and of course if i have an area that it's too subgingival in one of the restorations i might modify the rubber dam technique and uh, use it without having the rubber dam in the proximal surface of that tooth that is very deep but I try as much as possible and I make sure that I have sufficient clamps and specific clamps for anteriors to be able to um, isolate the teeth just by breathing. There's humidity there, there's saliva. So <clears throat> it's not a must, but we highly recommend it. And I think it worth the effort. All right. You gotta watch what you're doing. All right. So uh, you're familiar with uh, Traxodent? And is that, if, if so, is that a good uh, second cord replacement? Uh, it, it, it's a great technique to stop the bleeding and push down the gum so you can see it and scan it. But I think it's too aggressive for laminate veneers. If I'm doing a onlay between first and second molars or a crown and I'm very deep there, I will use it back there. But I wouldn't use it for the anterior region. Uh, when we have these type of patients that come to us for aesthetics, right? A minimal recession, a minimal black triangle will be could be catastrophic for them. And and and, and that's what, what they came for to avoid those things. So I wouldn't use something as um, aggressive on soft tissue. It's great, but for these type of situations that I'm I'm saying, mostly the posterior teeth or in a proximal for an inlay where, where it's bleeding or so. All right. So we have a lot of uh uh attendees that do traditional as well as uh, scanning, uh, but 
do you have a um, you probably have a preference on the digital chair side, but is, is there a, a pattern decision making whether you do it digital versus traditional, uh, or you know taking a, an impression? Is there a, certain cases that you know, hey, I, I can't do yeah. uh, chair side. I, I have to take a conventional impression, traditional, and have a lab yeah. uh, fabricate. Yeah, um, Jim, I don't make traditional impressions anymore, to be honest, for many years now. Uh, but I anticipate when I'm prepping and treatment planning the case that I'm going to be scanning. So uh, maybe first, you know, this is a patient, I'm going to be working with perio. We might be working on hygiene. We might be working on small um, gingivoplasty. So I, I understand that I don't need to battle with those tissues. but I don't like to treat difficult cases. I like to make the difficult cases easy cases first, and then I go in and treat them. Many times we just want to solve everything at once, and that's where we see the, the problems. And sometimes, how do I take a perfect PBS impression if it's two millimeters subgingival and it's blood there? Maybe we're used to just more PBS impression and the lab will take care of it, but um, with the scans, I see so much details, and um, that's that's how we do every single case I've shown, like today or or in the different uh, webinars. If the tissue is not ready, it's not ready for digital or for analog. Um, so I think that with the benefits of the scanners now, whether you get the latest um, Sarec or uh, Trios or Medit, those three scanners I've tried lately. Are, are great and, and if you just keep control for a few seconds you can really reach subgingival areas. The thing is it needs to be dry. There's there shouldn't be any any blood there. Uh, but we don't go for uh PBS impression of for any of our um veneer cases. And the labs that we work with uh they, they don't request uh PBS impressions anymore. All right. Okay. Um so uh, I think you answered this earlier. You you had mentioned when we were asking about the smile design software that also XOKI contains um, a portion of that. So uh, that was just a affirmative that uh, that that XOKI contains some of that uh, smile design software uh, was the question. So um, all right, why do you have to prepare? Uh, a full crown when we have to shift midline more than one millimeter. So I guess it's more of philosophically, if you, you you gave us that one millimeter boundary from a veneer to do a full crown. Uh, is that yeah. you you turn it into a full yeah. crown because of the contouring? To so so if I have a diastema bigger than one millimeter, I need to prep veneers that go around the proximal surface okay veneers not full coverage crowns okay more than one i need to wrap around the tooth with the veneer okay if i have more than two millimeters between the teeth then i need to go with the crown and i need to go deeper to be able to squeeze the tissue and support the tissue and have a vertical running room i love laminate veneers and i love to be uh conservative but i know from the lab side that i work and i do that with the veneer i'm more limited on shifting the midline also jim if you don't prep the crown the distal part of your tooth is still going to be too far out distally so if I'm trying to move everything here, two millimeters, I need to bring the whole tooth here, not only the mesial part of the tooth, but also the distal part of the tooth. So that's why sometimes in extreme cases with huge diastema, soft tissue um, losses or so, we need the full coverage crown. It was one out of five cases I think I showed you, but um, it's important to have this discussion with your technician. Your technician will know how limited he will he or she will be if there's not a complete migration to one side or to the other all right uh that's that's great because that, that's often asked about uh about that um in itself so 
Um, do you ever use a clear person to create your contact points uh, to, to help create a lens effect? If you, if you and your technician or yourself, if you work with uh, using a, a window type material on the on the interproximal contacts to to create any special nuance using clear window material. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, to be honest, Jim, not specifically for the proximal part of it. I like the window effect on the facial aspect, maybe middle and and, and size so third. Uh, maybe where, where you are layering and it might be a little too intense. It's sometimes difficult to control the intensity of the deeper uh, shades of ceramic you layer. So the filter effect, I like it. Uh, to be honest, we don't use it uh, like strictly for the proximal surface. Would you have something to add, Jim, on, on, that, on that maybe? Uh, I, I do like the window, but mostly for the facial. Yeah, it, I, I think it really depends on the uh, amount because once you go too much clear, it will gray out on you because uh, mm -hmm. now you're just yeah. it's going through and you're you're going to see the the black, you know, inside of the mouth. Um, so, you know, shade wise, what what you're trying to recreate, it, it it may you can run afoul if you use too much window. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, another question was we kind of touched on this earlier, but. Um, are the margins always 0.5 millimeters subgingival or at gingiva? At gingiva with the retraction cord in place, which is the triple zero. So it's basically at gingival position once retracted. And I think that the retraction that we achieve is around 0.5 millimeters. So it would be 0.5 uh, from the initial position of, of the gingiva. It's just enough to hide the junction okay um sometimes we have uh teeth that are darkened and that that discoloration goes deeper in the root as well so you don't want to stay too uh super gingival and then um have that junction uh, visible so for us uh, this is kind of a clinical tip the triple zero cord packed nicely very gently to the margin at that position just works great for both scanning and visualizing it, for control for cementing as well, and the soft tissue is not being invaded and you're not violating the uh, biologic width and all those those stories. But um, you might, someone else might have different different uh, concepts on that. Um, yep. Yeah. Uh, so one of the last questions uh, on that last case. You use you chose zirconia as the material choice. Can you kind yeah. of give everyone a kind of an idea of uh, why you chose a zirconia over some other type of material? What what was it yeah. you were thinking that that would be best for that case? You know, Jim, you, you just said it in the last answer with the window thing. Sometimes patient wants very bright teeth, very high value, and you are in between not prepping too much, but also achieving a very bright shade as well. So for that, zirconia is amazing. Zirconia kind of glows the soft tissue as well, and it's very biocompatible. So it's one more option. I'm not stopping to use those static ceramics now because we have these newer versions of zirconia that are very nice. It's just that it's, very nice to have so many good options okay it's great to see that we can bond to zirconia with following up this patient for three and a half years now she actually even sent her sister to us and uh things are working well um so we have the possibility to do it i like i like the brightness of zirconia i like the soft tissue response to zirconia and uh just keep it there as one more option and if the case comes to you and you say, well, this might be a good idea, why not, right? But um, I think that's why I presented one of the different families, right? From Pelspatic to Zirconia reinforced silicate and to uh, Zirconia. Zirconia, you know, you mill it 20 to 25% bigger. So when you have this feather edge shoulders, it mills flawless because the burr is smaller 
to the actual size of the restoration when it's being milled, then it will shrink and it will become a one-to-one -one like with all the other materials. So when you have these kind of vertical preparations, feather edge preps, in zirconia, they mill really, really nice. Then you center that and then you get the final fit and the fit is outstanding as well. So, so I mean, we, we could have another session on, on just on zirconia and some of the benefits, yeah. but I think it's, it's a material that uh, it's here to help us as well in many, many situations, also in aesthetic cases. All right. So, uh, last question: uh, How do you do you temperize? Do you, do you, on your veneers? Do you yeah. since you do a lot of side, you probably don't, but you have you had yeah. to. I, this afternoon, I'm doing two centrals. I'll, I, I'm ready, scheduled for delivering the final ones. Two centrals. It's straightforward. It's not crazy. The pressure, the designing, the timing, the glazing. No problem. If I'm doing six, if I want to correct the diastema, if I want to correct the deviation and midline, I don't want to put over pressure on me. I want the final outcome to be really good. So there, I would temporize. How do I temporize? I have my same potty matrix that is very nice, which we use for the mock-up. I will just put some bisoprel, put it in, remove the excess, and then remove the uh, matrix. My veneer provisionals are held to the tip by mechanical retention. I don't apply cement for the temporaries on veneers because I see them that they fall. So they kind of wrap around a little bit in the palette, a little bit in the proximal, and then with the needle burr from the burr block, I go around the soft tissue and remove any type of excess. And then I put some uh, chlorhexidine gel and give the patient some chlorhexidine during those days of temporization. And, and that I think that works very well. Uh, some clinicians make the provisional, take it out, remove the excess, and then cement it like we do with crowns. I, I, I see more decementation of, of provisionals for veneers with that technique. And if the preparations are very minimum and it's just uh, a few days, there's a lot of benefits not to provisionalize if they are 100% on enamel. So I discuss that with the patient and um, depending the case, uh, but yes, we need to have a, a, a plan for temporization. Mine is uh, bisacryl. I don't put any bonding agent or anything to the tooth or, or, or uh, too much Vaseline or anything, just you know a thin layer and mechanically uh, grabbing the neighbor teeth. All right. Okay. Yeah, that that would work well. So, uh, do you have any final thoughts on uh, the subject veneers, laminates, and you want to part everyone with, or any last minute comment you'd like to make? Yeah, I I would like to to mention that being being honest, there are so many more cases that we could be doing veneers and less crowns, and sometimes you know. Many students say, you know, but there's composite in the proximal, there's another composite. Yes, but nothing in the palatal. So you can make a wraparound veneer or a thick, thick water, let's say, but still keep the palatal surface on, on, on enamel. You will have even less uh, occlusal issues as well. Uh, and if we're talking um, occlusion, we got to have the space to create the veneers, right? If the space is not there, then there's no space for any material, composite or natural enamel or ceramic so we gotta maybe we can have another chapter on, on full mouth rehabilitation where we do veneers in the anteriors but we use the onlays and convert that to an ideal vertical dimension but they need space all right yeah it's uh you know conservative dentistry at its best and you know treatment planning correctly for what the best is for the patient for the health so that's it all right well, I, I want to thank you very much, Dr. Caneo, for uh, providing us with all that vital information, important information. I uh, love all your science behind everything, which is which is great. You not only practice dentistry, but you also do that research side and, and work within the, the uh, parameters of, of what's best for the, uh, the health of the, uh, your individual patients. So um, I want to thank you very much for, for today's uh, webinar. And I'd like to thank all the participants uh, for attending. 
and look forward to see you again on another Dr. Conejo uh, webinar in the future. Uh, but currently, this uh, this will conclude today's uh, webinar webinar with uh, Dr. Conejo for uh, Vita Learning. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you, everyone. Bye.